now, as we're seeing uh, this impending succession of the baby boomer population, um, for some firms it's becoming an emergency situation to transition these clients because many partners are retiring and it's, it's their clients have been their clients exclusively. Um, so, you know, now it's this event to transition clients and it's this kind of intimate situation trying to figure out the best ways to go about that and introducing other people in our firm to our clients and uh, making sure that, you know, their expectations are met and ours are too. So, um, you know, some of you might be experiencing that where it's more of an event right now trying to uh, approach transition and um, some other firms might have success in, you know, coming down the road here somewhat soon and, uh, you know, either way we want to shift the mindset of succession planning so that it's not event-based and it's not emergency-based, but that succession planning becomes part of our daily activities because, you know, we want to make sure that we're prepared for the future, that we're preparing our people, and, uh, and that it's just part of our culture. Um, so, you know, consider this from different perspectives and that, uh, you know, we're really looking at the mindset here. Um, and everyone needs to be involved with succession planning. So when it's ongoing, you know, it won't make it such a, a big deal to work with. So today we're going to explore uh, the best time to start transitioning. We're going to talk about uh, the most effective approach to transition, finding the appropriate successor, and then identifying the right time to talk to your clients. And like I said, many of us are from different roles, uh, you know, different levels of experience on this call. And, you know, some of this information you might already know, um, but, you know, there are going to be other things that you can take away from this. And so our end goal here is for you to get just one takeaway, one key idea that you can commit to try out as a result of this webinar. At the end, we're going to ask you what your one commitment is or what your one idea is. So as we start going through this information, uh, keep that in the back of your mind of what things here um, you could consider trying out. Uh, a partner in our firm, Jack Lee, wrote a blog about leaving a legacy. And part of his blog really um, called out to us. And he said, you must overcome the tendency to hang on too long by facing the reality that the ultimate expression of your success is in leaving a legacy that lives beyond you. That is why there is no success without succession. And we completely agree that, um, you know, a, a succession plan that wasn't well carried out, wasn't very smooth, um, you know, the clients weren't happy in the end or our people weren't happy in the end, uh, that's not going to help the retiree leave a legacy with the firm and with the people. Um, and so we want to make sure that we can respect the retiree's feelings too and that they're able to leave the legacy they desire. Uh, most people retiring and, you know, experiencing uh, succession planning and transitioning, they at some point experience, um, you know, an aspect of the five stages of grief, if you're familiar with those. And, you know, there's some denial involved where, uh, you know, the, the idea that we don't actually have to work on succession right now, it'll come in time, you know, it'll happen naturally, something like that. You know, there's also some anger. Um, where, you know, maybe resenting that we have to transition clients, that we have to start that process. Um, there might also be some bargaining going on, um, you know, and negotiating ways to put off this transition. Um, you know, there's usually a little bit of sadness, maybe even depression um, of the idea and of, you know, having to, to think about this process. And then ultimately acceptance, you know, um, and that acceptance of understanding that we want the firm to be in the best position going forward and our clients and our people. Um, so, you know, a lot of times these emotional sides of succession aren't talked about in the firm. There's not really space uh, to share or process their feelings. And so we have to acknowledge that those are out there and that we, uh, we have to be understanding of the emotional complexities um, of retirement. But we also have to ensure that we're following best practices and transition and, you know, so that our clients and our firm is satisfied in the end. So let's start out by talking about, the, you know, the best time to start transitioning clients. And I want to give you some perspective on um, current market demographics. 
We have 78 million baby boomers who are retiring in the next 10 to 12 years. Baby boomers are born from 1946 to 1964. We only have 50 million Gen Xers to succeed them. Um, the echo population of the baby boomers are the millennials, uh, and those are born in 1982 through 2000. And they, there's about 70 to 80 million strong there um, in that population. Currently, 36% of today's employees are millennials, and by 2025, it will be 75% millennial. So to give you some idea of what we're looking at uh, for the shift in demographics, you know, that's a, a huge change. And that also means that we're going to have a lot of young leaders stepping into, uh, you know, new roles at our firm. And, um, you know, we need to ensure that we're developing our people in helping them build relationships with clients as soon as possible. So to answer, you know, the best time to transition, it's now. Uh, as great client service professionals, you know, no matter what age, um, we ensure that our clients have multiple contacts and relationships within the firm. Um, and then that way, we're setting the client up for a smooth transition later. So, you know, we would say that it should be a best practice in your firm to declare projected retirement dates for all key leaders and all owners annually um, and get it out there so that it's known and so that we can plan for them. Um, you know, we don't want anything hidden in the closet um, that comes out down the road. Um, we also believe that at two years prior to a partner's retirement, that that person should document all of the critical areas they're responsible for um, and any necessary delegation that will be required to uh, create capacity for, um, you know, new client owners to take on those relationships, new responsibilities, you know, special knowledge or skills. And uh, we also have to make sure that a partner, another partner, and it's typically the managing partner, uh, is assigned to that retiring partner um, to review and facilitate the transition, you know, make sure there's a support system there and that it's actually happening. Um, you know, and ultimately we want to ensure that at least one other team member has a relationship with each of our clients and that they're learning about their business, learning about their personal needs, and are available to answer their questions. So, you know, we talked briefly about why we need to shift our succession mindset and uh, be developing these relationships as early as possible. Um, you know, so we're going to talk about now how to approach transition. Um, something Renee is going to talk about in a little bit as we uh, think about developing people, um, you know, how important it is to get uh, them involved as early as possible in, a, in the client relationships, in learning about their businesses. And um, so we'll talk about that further in a little bit. Um, we would suggest, as a best practice, to make a list of all the client relationships and engagements that you manage or participate, participate in, um, and to sort that list by uh, descending revenue order, and then look to see if Pareto's rule applies, which is that 80% of your revenue comes from 20% of your clients. Uh, and if this is the case, you know, we, we want to look at spending 80% of our energy ensuring that the transition of the top 20% of, of uh, our clients is happening. Um, you know, we have a sample of grid here uh, I'm going to show you on the next slide, but it's also in the handout section of this webinar, so we'd encourage you to download that as well as an article. Um, but this transition grid is, is helpful for succession, um, and what you might do is pull each of your partner's clients, you know, pull a list, um, and it's the ones that are retiring, you know, order their clients A, B, or C uh, as to, you know, revenue, where they stand, um, and making sure that we're paying attention to those clients so that we can see who does need to be transitioned. And obviously, we're going to focus first on the partner's clients uh, that need to be transitioned. Um, something to note on these is that uh, you know we don't we can't ask a retiring partner to create these grids um, because it probably just won't happen. Um, you know they might have the best of intentions, um, but they get busy with their own um, things going on in the firm, their clients, their responsibilities, and so we need to have somebody like you know a firm administrator um, or another partner help support 
uh, the person as well and generate a report, sit down with them to prioritize you know, the A, B, and C clients. So somebody other than the partner has to own that or it's not going to happen. And so keep that in mind um, as you think about this grid and how you might use it in your own organization. You know, and I mentioned before that uh, succession does bring those emotional sides to it. And some partners are in a little bit of denial that they're retiring and won't face it. And so, you know, we want to pay attention to that emotional side of it. Um, you know, and then some also have this idea that nobody can take care of my clients like I can. So I'm just going to hold on to them. Um, you know, or it might just, this is going to happen naturally. Uh, the client's just going to be happy going to the next client owner. We don't really have to, you know, do any prep work ahead of time. We don't really need to think about that too much. So we definitely think it requires um, somebody else, you know, someone on the executive committee or maybe it's the managing partner. And it depends on the size of your firm and how you're organized. But, uh, you know, sit down and organize these clients and maybe start with just a, a third of them, you know, a small subset of clients um, to first tackle and, and, you know, determine what the next steps are. So we don't want to deflect. You know, we want to be, uh, have our eyes wide open to who the clients are, um, how they uh, rank as far as revenue and as far as, um, you know, client service aspects. Um, so that we can identify gaps and uh, the training needed, the experience needed, um, and figure out how we can get, uh, develop our people so that they have that training, you know, and they have that necessary development. Um, so, you know, we would suggest starting out with the partners who are retiring in the next two to three years and planning that far ahead um, so that we can see what we're looking at. Um, you know, as we have multiple partners retiring, um, over a, a course of many years, it becomes um, additionally complicated and, uh, you know, we, we need to have a clear picture of what we're looking at as far as client lists. Now, we can do the same thing with our um, prospects and our referral sources. So, uh, the grid that we included on, this, on the resources here, um, it works for both. And so, clients aren't the only ones who need to be transitioned and sometimes that's forgotten that um, you know, we're focused so much on our clients and ensuring that uh, we're setting them up for success um, and we might do a really good job of that, but then we forget about our prospects or we forget about our key referral source relationships. So we want to make sure that we are tracking those as well. Similar to clients, you know, make a list of all the referral source, uh, the alliance and prospect relationships and then identify the top 20% of those that you need to focus on. Uh, something to remember is that usually the other person um, in these relationships is a similar age to the retiring partner. So, you know, a referral source typically would be the same age or a similar age as the retiring partner. So the transition may not be, you know, uh, just an individual thing, but it would be with the organization, and so we have to identify who the successor is in our referral sources organization, and we have to start meeting the four of us together so that we can build that relationship um, and not just let it, you know, dwindle or die off completely. So uh, make sure that you are paying attention to prospects and referral sources as well. I mentioned earlier about ranking your clients, and you might not... Uh, know how you your firm would define A, B, C, or D clients. Um, and so a starting point would be here where we say our A clients are those who are most valuable, they're our most important client relationships that we own, and we would just cry if we lost them. You know, we can't think of losing that client because they're such an important um, role in our firm. Uh, the B clients are the pretty great clients. Um, you know, they might just be Bs because they don't garner as much revenue as our A's. Um, the C clients, you know, might have a few issues. They're all right. Uh, but the D ones are those who are hard to serve, um, you know, due to culture, risk, payment issues, uh, their inability to value organiza organization services. Um, you know, if they're always getting their documents and their files to you late and it affects your um, client service ability, you know, that's 
that's a problem. And so um, I bet if you ask your staff, they could answer who your D clients are. So <laughs> you might need to go to them for some perspective. But when you're using that client transition grid, you know, use this ranking as a basis for deciding, you know, who your your top priority clients are and how you're going to transition them to the new client owner. So after we've decided who the, the top priority clients are that we need to transition, uh, you know, we need to sit down with the successor and we need to meet individually um, and discuss the right communication, um, the right service strategy for the client that they are taking or the multiple clients, you know, the, the new responsibilities. Um, and we need to also make sure that we're sharing our knowledge of the client. Uh, that we're reviewing client files and billings, um, you know, going over the information that we have so that the successor um, can know as much as we know and uh, feel comfortable taking on that new responsibility. We also want to encourage our successor, though, to take on uh, their own ownership of it by reading about the clients online, you know, looking at their websites, social media, uh, getting to know their businesses from that perspective um, and from what they're marketing to the public. And uh, we also want to ask for their input, you know, to see how the transition should go from their perspective and make sure that they're on board for it all. Um, it might be easy to kind of hand them this plan and say, this is how it's going to go. Hopefully you're okay with it. But we want to make sure that they are, um, you know, on board with what we're asking them to do and that we have a clear communication strategy um, and a clear succession strategy for the engagement. And part of you know, transitioning this responsibility is ensuring that the successor understands what ownership is um, and defines what ownership means. Um, so we want to take just a, a minute to discuss that um, and, and how we define ownership um, to us you know, there's not always a clear understanding of what ownership really means. I mentioned earlier that some partners say these are my clients and nobody else can talk to them except for me. Um, and we wouldn't call that ownership. We would just say that that's controlling. But owners, uh, they do the thinking for the things that they own. They plan for the future of the things that they own. Um, you know, that means that they're reading last year's file or work papers, planning new work. You know, they're identifying potential roadblocks or obstacles that they might need to overcome. You know, they're, they're looking beyond client requests and seeing what else they might need. And they're also managing expectations, you know, resetting expectations, and then, um, you know, communicating as appropriate. Um, they're enrolling the ownership of others. So they might own the client, which means they're responsible for the thinking and the success of that client. But they're going to enroll, you know, our team members to help us with the client engagement, and they're going to lead that effort as well. Um, we're also going to communicate about the things as owners, um, and you know, being the point person for all client commu communication, inbound and outbound to the client, and then participating in meetings, you know, planning for them and leading for those, leading those meetings, writing the recaps, including others as needed. But, uh, you know, the owner takes responsibility for the areas they own when they're off track. So they know that they're the person who has to take care of, of the client that they own, you know, fix things when there's uh, challenges or when the client has an issue, you know, keep it thriving. Um, and so we think it's important to uh, relay this definition of ownership to the new client owners, you know, um, making sure that they see client service in the same perspective that you do um, and, and how they can, you know, become better owners of their responsibilities and of their clients. So we would encourage that you take along a shadow uh, to each of your, you know, meetings, your telephone calls uh, with the future clients, you know, whenever possible, bring them with. Uh, and, you know, first, we want to establish the expectation that the success is just shadowing. You know, they're going to shadow us and listen and learn, and then they can come to us with questions afterward of how they felt about the, the meeting or, you know, what they didn't understand, what they need clarification on. And then we might set the expectation that on the second meeting, 
they'll take responsibility for a certain aspect. They'll lead a certain part of that meeting. Um, and then once again, you know, come back uh, afterwards and discuss how it went, what uh, concerns or, you know, questions they have from that. But then by the third meeting, you know, the partner might not even need to go along at that point. We might not even have to attend but just check in afterwards. So, you know, we're not saying that this has to be a, a really drawn out process. Um, you know, it might take just these three meetings for them to feel comfortable leading, leading the conversations and, um, you know, talking to the clients. So it also depends on the size of engagement. You know, a tax return might be faster and something bigger would, would take longer. So it's going to depend on, on the clients and on the engagement. But, you know, we think that's a, a great way to do it is to, um, is to work with our successor and have them with that understanding that, you know, they're going to participate soon. But, you know, it's a learning process and we're going to allow that learning to happen and uh, we're going to be their champion, their supporter, as they get ready to take on our clients. So after, uh, you know, we get our successors meeting with us or coming to our client meetings, um, you know, we want to encourage them to begin taking responsibility, taking that ownership of the client relationship success, having them feel like they are responsible for it. Um, you know, so then that way they can come to you with thoughts uh, and ideas, and, you know, get feedback um, while keeping you in the loop. We're not saying that the original client owner, the, the retiring partner is no longer in the loop, um, but that they're acting as support, you know, and really ensuring that the new client owner has all the tools they need. They feel prepared for this. Um, and so, you know, work with the successor to plan and manage the engagement scope um, and communicate with the client you know, enroll the other people who are serving the clients and, and take point in client meetings. We think it's super important. Um, you know, they're going to have questions and they're going to have ideas and uh, you can act as support until they feel ready and, you know, you can basically cut them loose to manage things while keeping you in that loop. Um, you know, another thought to this is that we really should be asking clients to do that as well. Um, you know, we want them to bring not only their younger team members, because our clients are likely having the same succession challenges that we are, so we want to be encouraging them to succession plan and, you know, bring their other team members, but we also want to make contact with other people at the client so that we don't only have a single contact. Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is, is lose one of our clients because we only knew the CFO at that client and then the CFO left and, you know, somehow it wasn't communicated that we were working with them and, um, you know, it becomes a, a difficult sell after that when we don't have any relationship with another, you know, contact in our client's office. So we would definitely say to let your clients know that we're going to bring, you know, we're, I'm going to bring my team member, um, you know, John with me on here. He's uh, He's going to learn how, uh, you know, how our relationship works and how your engagement works. And I would, you know, love if you brought someone from your firm along as well. Um, and, you know, we think it's important to be building these relationships. Um, so as broad of a relationship with our client as we can create is going to serve us in the long run um, and make sure that we're uh, talking to multiple people at our clients. So definitely important. Now, the hard part with, um, you know, taking along a shadow, developing this successor to, to take on our clients and our relationships um, is this idea that, you know, we're no longer considered the smartest person in the room or at least that's where we want to be, that, you know, we don't have all the answers anymore because our successor does and we're going to let them take it control of of the engagement and let them be responsible for it. And so this is often the hardest part of the retirement and transition process for great client service providers. Um, you know, we, we need to make sure that we step back and we let the successor uh, come up with the solutions and come up with the answers. And sometimes, um, you know, you might have to double back. The, the person might say something that you would have said differently um, but we want to talk about it afterwards and then go back to the client and say, you know, we discussed this and, you know, we maybe have some modifications um, based on our discussion. Um, because there will be missteps 
and there will be issues, um, you know, and we just want to make sure that we're making our successor look completely capable, in fact, more capable of, you know, what we're doing for the client so that the client feels um, really comfortable with the new relationship. You know, a lot of you answered in the beginning that that was one of your biggest concerns with succession is the client not wishing to stay with us. So if we're able to develop those relationships as early as possible and making sure that the client um, is in, you know, really good communication with the successor, that's how we're best going to avoid that concern that they won't want to stay with us anymore because the new person we're putting on their account, the new owner, is not really new. The client's familiar with that person. You know, they believe they're doing their work and they're leading the engagement. You know, and by the time that uh, you've transitioned out of the firm, you know, the client is completely used to the, the successor being, um, you know, leading the meetings and leading the, the engagement and the client service. So, you know, keep that in mind that this idea of, of our successor being the smartest person in the room and the one with the answers. If the client looks to me and asks me a question, I'm going to turn to my successor and let them answer it. You know, it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to sit back and, and be quiet, especially when the answer is on the tip of our tongue. And, you know, we really just want to, to provide the answer. But we need to make sure that we're letting that development happen. We're letting them think through those solutions on their own. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, it's really important to debrief after our meeting with our successors, you know, and discussing any possible concerns, um, any questions they have. But, uh, you know, it then allows them to continue thinking about the client and the engagement and come up with additional suggestions, ideas, um, you know, and like I said, there might be some corrections from the meeting uh, afterwards, and you'll have to go back to the client at that point, but the successor is going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Um, so we're really going to just completely move responsibility of communication over to our successor. Um, you know, like I said, there's an emotional side to this. Um, and we like this quote by Ann Landers, and she says, some people believe holding on and hanging in there are signs of great strength. However, there are times when it takes much more strength to know when to let go and then do it. And we think that's very true. It's, um, it can feel like this, you know, really great effort to stay working as long as possible, um, you know, to keep uh, serving our clients as long as possible. Um, but then... Uh, you know, when it comes down to transitioning or what if we're forced to stop working at some point, um, you know, it, it takes more strength to plan for it and, and let it happen and be proactive about it than to just let it happen to us and then leave our people, um, you know, scrambling to, to transition our clients for us. So, um, you know, something about mindset is to think about um, that perspective. And so I'm going to turn it over to Renee, and she's going to talk to us about finding the right successor for clients. So Renee, I'm going to hand you controls. Thank you, Brianna. So let me just get my screen up here. So can you see that OK, Brianna? Oh. Finding the right successor? Uh, yeah. OK, yeah. great. So everyone, my name is Renee Mulders. I'm excited to be with you today to continue this discussion about succession and transition. And so now we're going to talk about finding the right successor for your clients. Um, and so the first step to that is identifying a successor who is the best fit. And I, I think the first thing that's important to say is that this is not going to be a perfect successor. This is not necessarily going to be a carbon copy of who you are or who the current client owner is. I think it's important for us to remember as we're thinking about this that as we were coming up and, and developing in our own careers, there were those who came before us and were above us in the organization who probably had doubts about us, perhaps our technical ability or our leadership capabilities, our communication skills, our people skills. and. Um, so we need to have room there for uh, people to have continued development. They won't necessarily be perfect and ready. And that's why Brianna kind of walked us through this process of um, shadowing and getting someone ready. Um, so another thing to note is that rarely are we just going to take our whole book and hand it over to one owner. Um, 
you know, ordinarily you're going to have to kind of divvy it up and look for the right fit rather than just uh, dropping all of it on one person's desk. Um, and part of that's going to be a capacity issue because as we're going to talk about on the next slide, these folks that you're transitioning to um, are going to have to do some transition themselves to create capacity to be able to take on this work. So that's part of it. The other thing is we're looking for that fit. We're looking for someone who will fit with the client personally, culturally, or that has a technical skill set that the client needs today or perhaps is going to need in the future. Um, also, we see that um, in some firms, you know, traditionally, clients have only been owned by partners. But as they are growing their firms and they are going through all of this transition, they're having to sort of change their mindset and transition some clients to managers um, for, to handle. And so this is a little bit of a cultural change for organizations. And certainly, there might be more shadowing involved there or creating some processes and procedures to ready the firm for that you know, difference in procedure. Um, but that may be something that you need to consider as you're looking for that right fit. Then the next thing we want to keep in mind is that this is going to create a ripple effect. And this is what I previewed in the last slide. Successors who are taking on this work have their own workload today that they are trying to manage. And so as we transition to them, they're going to have to find a new home for some of that work. And so we need to help as an organization to look at that and make sure that those people are set up for success and are delegating their own workload to create capacity for the work that they're taking on. And it's important as we're thinking about that to look at the client side of it, but also consider all sorts of responsibilities, just as we are for the transitioning partner. We want to look at their internal responsibilities, if they have quality control role, or they're doing some sort of scheduling role. We want to look at whether or not they're managing a large number of staff or some of our largest projects in the firm. Or maybe they have a large amount of networking responsibilities and marketing responsibilities. So kind of considering that big picture for these people who are going to be taking on the work to make sure as we start pushing over client responsibilities that they're going to be able to manage that successfully. Um, we may need to sit down with these new owners and help them do a client transition grid, just like we're doing with the transitioning partners. So have them list out all their client engagement responsibilities, sort them by um, defending revenue, and then start trying to decide where, you know, where those should go if they can't manage them anymore. And then we want to consider the big picture. So um, you know, we're talking probably in your firm when you're looking at transition, you're looking at the next couple of years. But there's a bigger picture with which Brianna previewed for you, which is that there's a ton of transition on the horizon for the baby boomers and then for the Gen Xers behind them. So we really want to look at a little bit longer term horizon, who's retiring in the next couple of years, but then the next five and the next 10. What we don't want to do is make decisions today and, let's say, transition a number of clients to some of our best people who, five years from now, we're going to need to take on, let's say, the, you know, the highest level clients in the firm. So we want to be sure that we're not um, using up all that capacity today that we're going to need in the next couple of years. And I'm sure you all know your, our clients don't want a new owner every few years. They like to see that consistency. And so as much as possible, if we can consider that long-term horizon and try to look ahead and plan, if we're retiring a tax partner, let's say in the next two years, who has maybe a smaller um, individual practice, we might want to um, give his practice, move that over to some managers. So we're reserving some partner capacity for a future retirement of, let's say, a corporate tax partner who's going to be retiring in five years. Um, so trying to think ahead so that our clients aren't faced with multiple transitions over a few years. The other thing we want to consider is that you know, as we're looking at this, it might indicate the need to hire. So we want to be sure that we've got a recruiting engine in the organization, that we're prepped and ready to go. We may need to call on that to get us through tr transition over the next two to five to 10 years. 
we also are probably going to have to look at leadership development in our organizations more. And we're talking a lot to firms about leadership development. It's a hot topic. I'm sure you guys are hearing a lot about it. Um, I think as an industry, we expected people to get lead the leadership skills that they needed just with time in. And that hasn't really happened. Um, or, you know, we're trying to get these millennial leaders that Brianna talked about. We need them to get ready faster. We don't have the time to wait for time in for those leaders. And so we may have to be more deliberate about getting them the leadership development training that they need. Or perhaps it's even industry expertise training, technical training. Business development training is a huge one for firms because for a lot of us um, in public accounting, our retiring partners are our rainmakers. So getting that next generation of rainmakers the training they need to get ready and get out there to sell business for our firm. And then another area is quality control. You know, that tends to be at the partner level. And if you're going to be retiring a quality control partner in two to three to four years, you may need to hire someone today who can, so we can get that person under that partner's wing and start getting them ready and trained in so they can take over that role within the organization. Uh, Renee, can I chime in for a second? Oh, please, um, yeah. I just had a thought, too, as you were talking about uh, development and ensuring that they're ready uh, to take on the, the new client, the new responsibilities. And, you know, back in our, um, our second poll that we took, we said half, Half of you were worried that the client will not wish to stay with us, but then 27% were uh, worried that the new owner won't be ready to fully own the client. Um, and you know, we think that that is uh, an example of where we can be responsible for making sure they're ready to own that client. You know, there is this idea that uh, many have where no one else can serve our client as well as I can, but um, you know, we need to let go of that and uh, really focus on getting them the training, like Renee said, um, that they need and being in charge of their development. So, you know, um, I think that's an important uh, point to make and, uh, you know, that we really need to be focused on the training um, and that we're planning these out ahead of time. Like she said, you know, contemplating the ripple effect um, and thinking about it from a people development perspective. So I just wanted to add that in since I know we had a, a good uh, amount of people who are concerned about that. That's a great point, Brianna, and I, I love the way that that moves us from that kind of helpless point of view of, oh no, all of this is happening and we're not going to be ready to what are the steps that we can take today to get ourselves ready. And those are some really tangible steps, identifying those gaps so we can get our people ready so that we can continue this firm on the way we have in the past. That's a great point. So then we want to think carefully about our C&D clients. And Brianna talked about uh, ranking our clients um, and how that's something that you can do to sort of prioritize as you're transitioning so you make sure that you're really focusing on your best clients first. Um, you know, I, I think this is a difficult um, thing for firms to do, to, to rank their clients in general. And I, I think oftentimes we feel it's unfair or we feel it's ungrateful that some clients are better than others, or does that mean some clients deserve to be served better than others? But I think we really, with our capacity issues in public accounting and the difficulty that we're having hiring, we really have to face the fact that we only have so much time and effort available to spend with our clients. And so without kind of going through this scrutiny and ranking our clients, we risk losing those most important, most valuable A clients that, you know, according to Pareto's rule, probably provide 80% um, of our revenue. And it's a small, you know, 20% of our clients, likely. Um, so we, we don't, I, we would say don't take that risk. You know, go through the process, go ahead and rank your clients. Um, and it can really help you in these times when you are transitioning, you have people leaving the firm, and it may exasperate your capacity issues. Then we would say don't saddle your best and brightest with your lowest ranking clients. Um, you know, client transition is the perfect time for you to say goodbye to D clients. And I, I always think about this, uh, this D client issue is, you know, it's a, it's a problem that every organization knows that they have and uh, they just 
can't figure out how to deal with it. And it, it is doable. And I'm going to share something with you on the next slide that might help. Um, but organizations are doing this. They are talking to clients about this. And you, you could be the firm that deals with that issue and doesn't just hand it off to the next generation. And that, you know, I think that's really the right answer, especially if you have capacity issues. And then um, you may want to look at your C clients. I mean, these oftentimes are good clients. We like them. But they may not really fit our ideal profile, or they, um, you know, they may be more work than the revenue is warranted. Or you'll have to look at it for your own firm. But if you are strapped for time and capacity and aren't able to hire to to um, fix that problem, then you may need to look at your C clients as well. I, I think one other thing to just consider with ranking clients is um, that oftentimes our worst client could be another practitioner's best client. And it, it reminds me of with people management, you often read this where um, someone will say, you know, your uh, worst employee could be someone else's best employee. So oftentimes it's a fit issue with our clients, our D clients. And so perhaps it's time for you to kind of let them go and let them go become someone else's jewel. Because there are practitioners out there who want to serve those clients that you aren't interested in serving. So we give you this little snippet um, of a client termination language that you, uh, you can look at and um, see if that would be helpful for you. Um, we want to show you here that it's doable. I mean, this is a sample that we helped a firm produce so that they could go through this effort. They had a retiring partner. And they weren't going to be able to keep all of her clients. And you know, she was on board with that. The firm was on board with that. So they went through this communication process together. Um, but again, you know, we get emotionally attached to our clients. But if they aren't ideal, if they aren't an ideal fit for our organization, then we aren't necessarily serving them the best way we can. And it might be time for us to think about letting them go. So here's our third poll. If you guys could all answer this for us, please. Um, and so, uh, and Zach, if you could launch that for us. Um, how is your firm doing with culling C and D clients? You may be uh, reviewing client lists annually to identify and cull the clients. Um, you may know who they are, but you rarely, rarely cull them. You could maybe do a better job at even identifying them. And then some firms are just leaving it to individual practitioners to manage, which uh, we definitely wouldn't advocate for. That doesn't sound like the managed approach. And then you may have an other uh, approach that your firm is taking. And so if you do, please chat your answer to us, because we'd love to hear it. And I don't know if we've said that, but we'd love to get any of your questions. You can just put those in the chat box, and we'll take a look at them and answer them if we can. Um, so Zach, are you there? Can you launch the poll for us? Yeah, I am. The poll's launched right now, and we're. Oh, I'm sorry. About, Maybe I just can't see it. Sorry about oh, that. That's really fine. Yeah, we're about up to 70% answered, so we're waiting for a few more answers to come in, and then I'll go ahead and show the results for it. Thank you. All righty, the results are in. And I Zach, can you read them to me? Because I can't, uh, I can't see the poll results. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. OK, so 2% say we review client lists annually to identify and call C and D clients. 42% um, say we know who our C and D clients are, but we rarely call them. And 31% say we could do a better job at identifying our C and D clients. 20% say we leave this to individual practitioners to manage. And 5% say other. OK. And um, Zach, let me know if you get any um, answers in the chat box. I haven't seen anything so far, but feel free to jump in if you see it. Um, so, Absolutely. You know, it, it, oh, thank you. So it looks like there's a lot of room for improvement here. Um, only 2% are annually reviewing their list and making decisions about whether to keep C&D clients. Um, you know, it's hard. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's hard. And firms, we talk about it, and we want to get better at it. But I think a lot of times it's very political. It's very emotional. Um, but this is, it is possible to do this. And there are organizations out there that are doing it successfully. So um, 
consider that. It can be a really powerful tool for managing capacity and really getting your firm um, serving those ideal clients that everybody enjoys serving and that kind of feed one another and feed your business development efforts. So uh, the best time to tell your clients is what we're going to talk about next. And we find that many clients approach this in a very haphazard manner. And what we'd really like to see and what works the best in our mind is to just be very deliberate and strategic about it. Um, so let's uh, jump into that. And actually, we're going to follow up right away with another poll. Um, Zach, if you don't mind launching that. And so when does your organization talk to clients about changes in ownership of their account? Maybe you do that 12 months or, or uh, 12 or more months prior to expected retirement, 6 to 12 months, 3 to 6 months, or at very near the owner's client retire the client owner's retirement, excuse me. Or maybe it's always different and always dependent upon the individual client. If you have any other thoughts on this too, don't forget you can chat those in the chat box and we'll try to address those for you. About up to 60% answered. And then I'll go ahead and launch the polls once we get a few more in. Thank you. All right, so the results are in. We have 28% that say 12 or more months prior to the owner's expected retirement. 7% say uh, 6 to 12 months prior to the owner's expected retirement. 4% say 3 to 6 months prior to the owner's expected retirement. And 22% at the at or very near the client owner's retirement date. 38% mm -hmm. say it's always different and dependent upon the client. OK. Well, and uh, I, I'm not really surprised by the results, although I'm cheered to see that uh, almost 30% of you are doing it 12 or more months prior to expected retirement. So that's great. That gives you time to work with that new owner to get them ready, identify any gaps and uh, knowledge or gaps in skill and fill those gaps. Um, as we get into this at or near the client owner's retirement, 22%, you know, it's hard to, uh, to really manage and make sure that you have everything ready um, and that we don't, in the end, lose that client as a result. And then um, as far as it being different and dependent upon the client, I, I understand this, um, you know, this sentiment or this kind of, I, I suspect this is smaller organizations that have uh, not, a, not a, or a less corporate um, structure that they're working under as an organization. Um, but it's, it's difficult to manage that then. It's difficult to make sure that that practitioner is finding the right successor has done all the things that need to be done to keep that client. So best practice we're going to talk about next. Um, we have some best practices here that we'll share with you. And the first one is that when you're one and a half to two years from retirement, we really feel like partners should be transparent with their clients about their plans. Um, and we'll talk to you a minute about what to say or what you can say. But what we want to emphasize here is that so many partners don't want to come clean, either with their firm or especially with their clients about their plans. And they feel like they can just be quiet about it and uh, that everything will be all right in the end. Um, but we need to understand this can have a negative effect. And that you know, might be that clients really notice that their practitioner is nearing retirement age. I mean, uh, they can see what's happening, and they draw their own conclusions about that. And so staying silent could encourage clients to make up their own stories. Well, this firm really doesn't care about me because they're not telling me what's happening, and I can't get ready for it. So I've got this other CPA who's calling me you know, twice a year to check in with me. Are my needs being met? Well, I'm not sure my needs are going to be met. So perhaps I should start talking to this person who's calling me. So I think we just we need to watch out for this. I mean, this. This is where clients go, uh, they leave. And uh, you know, your clients are getting calls from other practitioners. Just as you're going out there and looking at new prospects, other practitioners are looking at your clients as prospects. And so we want to be sure that our lack of transparency isn't sending the wrong message to the client. 
And then we, we also want to emphasize that you want to have your message together internally before you start talking to clients. Um, so before you tell your clients, you want to have an agreed upon internal position statement, we would call it. Um, you, sometimes we call it FAQs, or frequently asked questions. And so larger organizations might actually develop these documents and have a meeting and sit down with everyone and say, this person is two years out from retirement. We are going to start talking to clients about it. Here's the message. Here are the things that you should say if you get asked questions. Um, what we don't want to happen is that um, clients hear from a staff or a senior before they hear from you. And so you really you want to tell your team you want to have a strategy and an internal position statement, and then you want to go out there and start communicating with your clients. So two years from retirement, you might start communicating your date, at least perhaps for some of your largest clients, your best clients, that 20%. And you want to assure those clients that you will continue with existing client responsibilities. Uh, you can say you'll stay involved because you are going to stay involved. You're going to be uh, have that person shadowing you for a period of time, and then you're going to be kind of backing into the shadows. But you're still going to be involved. You're going to be there for your successor to ask questions. And then ideally, towards the end of that two years, you just kind of fade off and kind of exit out smoothly and the client is perfectly happy with how everything goes. And then we need to consider the timing. Um, and you can use your client grid to help you with this. Uh, it, you know, it's challenging for practitioners who have a large book of business to think about transitioning all those clients at once. And so perhaps you're going to do that in waves. And uh, you may map out a certain group that you're going to transition. Let's say if you have two years until you're retiring, you might start in the fall working on you know, 20% of that or um, a third of that or something like that. And you might start with your A clients first. Um, we would recommend that you use busy season to introduce new contacts. And I know this is challenging because everybody, we are so busy in busy seasons. And you know, we often hear partners say there isn't time to do that. But really, it's important that we make the time during busy season. Uh, we know that's the best time of contact for some of our clients. And some of them we don't speak to at any other time during the year. So it's essential that we take the opportunity when that client comes in to bring us their individual tax return information to just go grab that other person or schedule the meeting so that the successor can come and meet the person and have that personal contact. Then slower time periods are a really great time for the successors to start to show interest and deepen those relationships with their newly owned clients. And uh, so, you know, you guys get together, you and the successor and the client, and maybe you go to lunch or do that out of cycle contact. And as Brianna talked about, hopefully you will ask the client to also bring someone else along. Um, so that you can be deepening and broadening that relationship with the client. And then you may decide to communicate by group. And what I mean by that is that you might communicate in different ways based on the groups. So if you go through this rating process and your A and B clients are your most important, most essential clients, you may choose to contact each of those people in person and talk to them about the impending transition. And then you might choose to, to tell the C&D clients by letter or by email. So again, you don't have to treat every client the same, um, and that's OK. Uh, you just want to be sure that there are no surprises, that there isn't some public announcement of retirement, or like I said, a staff member doesn't just accidentally mention something to a client, and the client says, I had no idea, and is perhaps upset about the fact that they weren't in the loop on that. So we're working for no surprises. And uh, we often hear firms say, well, we've got a partner who doesn't want to tell us clients, or we have a partner who refuses to transition, won't get involved. Um, and so in that case, you really want to be sure, and this isn't in the slides, but you want to check your incentives. So you want to be sure that your compensation for a partner who's two years from retirement, really he shouldn't be incented, he or she shouldn't be incented anymore to be working on current production, but really his incentives should point towards um, transition and making sure that transition goes smoothly. 
You might also look at deferred comp agreements where you can take back some of the deferred comp if you have a, a number of clients leave the firm as a result of poorly managed transition. So if you, you know, are just hitting these roadblocks, look at your incentives. And you may not be able to do that for partners transitioning immediately, but uh, you may be able to get ahead of that for this wave of partners that we're going to see transitioning out of the profession in the next 15 years. And then we have some proactive ideas here that we wanted to share with you guys. Um, there's no doubt that firms that have strong organizational constructs in place, like defined roles and responsibilities, will have an easier time managing transition. Because really, as we've talked about, the transition is all about finding out all the things that you're responsible for and then making sure that someone else is going to take over that responsibility. And so clear roles and responsibilities just make it easier to identify those gaps, move pieces around, uh, decide who the right successors might be, or if you might need to go out and do some recruiting to fill gaps, <clears throat> excuse me, what the development needs might be for those people coming up. So consider some of these ideas, um, what kind of development needs here, technical, soft skills, business process, and business, business management. Um, you know, gives you an, a way to look at all of that big picture and make sure that you're covering all your bases. And I just wanted to mention, Brianna talked a little bit about ownership and our own convergence coaching ownership concept. And we are going to be holding an ownership and accountability webinar on September 22nd. So we'd love for you to join us. You can find that webinar on our website. Or you can also email us on the contact us page if you'd like to get on our mailing list or if you have any questions about that upcoming webinar or any of the concepts that we discussed in the webinar. So we love this quote. Um, you know, being a leader is about more than just getting the work done. I mean, I think that's uh, what we're saying here. We need to be focused on creating future practice value and creating future capacity in our organizations. And it's it's actually very exciting, right? This is the big picture. This is um, this is why we all come to work. It's not just about getting the the work done and the tax returns out and the audits complete, but it's really about growing our people and growing the capacity of our organizations. And that's what our transition is all about, too. So we would love to hear from you what one thing you would like to take out of this seminar. Brianna mentioned that, and Beck, you can go ahead and kick off the poll if you want. Um, so uh, we hope that you took take one thing away from this. You may have heard some of these concepts um, along the way. Some may be familiar. But hopefully there was one new exciting thing that you can take back to your firm and perhaps implement in your organization. So you may start introducing multiple contacts to your clients today, even if you're not transitioning, but just as a best practice. Uh, you may rate your clients to see where you should be focusing your efforts. Take successors along to client meetings. Take someone with, as Brianna says. Or determine the ripple effect coming in with multiple retirements. So really looking out at that long-term horizon and trying to get a big picture of what's happening with transition in your firm. And if you have another response, please feel free to chat it to us. We'd love to see that. We're about at 70%. I'm going to wait for a few more people to answer before I show the results. Sure. All righty. I'm closing down the poll and sharing the results. So 13% um, said that they would start introducing multiple contracts to my clients now. 51% say they rate my clients to see where I should focus my efforts. 8% say they will take successors along to client meetings. 19% say that they will determine the ripple effect coming with multiple retirements. And 9% say other. OK, great. Thank you, Zach. So uh, half of you are interested in rating your clients. And I think that's, that's really great. Um, I'd also love to see more of you introducing multiple contacts to your clients. And I know this is a big shift for us. We, uh, we like to be in control of our clients. Um, 
and that's sort of an industry trend, but we're trying to trend away from that. So hopefully you'll, more of you will consider that idea. And then also taking someone along. So um, this is uh, a great way to get people development, uh, d development and the skills that they need is to let them come along and watch what you do so that they know where they're going and they know what they need to learn to get there. Um, so you guys, this has been really fun being here with you today to talk about transition. And I hope you will look. Zach's going to talk to us for a couple of minutes about profit sense. Um, but I hope you'll look through the resources in the back. Uh, we have uh, some things that we wanted to share with you, which may be useful to you in thinking about transition. And uh, please feel free to connect with either myself or Brianna. We have our LinkedIn contact information there and our email addresses. And we would really love to hear from you on your transition challenges or any other questions that you have for us. So Zach, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Do you want me just to keep control, or you want me to hand it? Yeah, that's fine. Really do that. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, well, I had mentioned earlier what SageWorks does as a company, um, but to cover that again briefly, we provide financial analysis solutions to help financial professionals streamline their advisory engagements. Um, so specifically for accountants, we have a software called ProfitSense. Um, ProfitSense is an accounting solution designed to help firms strategically build client relationships, um, provide advisory services, and perform the core functions of their firm, all within one easy-to-use software solution. Um, and so this um, solution all is built upon a database um, that provides real-time data um, that is compiled from private company financial statements. And all these private company financial statements come from CPAs, banks, and credit unions. So they're very rigorously um, um, sought through and made sure that it's solid data. Um, and all of that data can be broken down into um, specific industries um, by NAICS codes and geographic regions. Um, as far as what ProfitSense can help you do, uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, next slide, uh, one of the things that we can see here is um, really in this whole conversation, um, one of the big things that, that popped out from all the poll questions was a focus on retaining clients. Um, retaining clients is easy to do with ProfitSense. Um, the two things that it helps you to do is it differentiates your firm from other firms. Um, one of the big ways that it does that is it's taking really difficult financial information that you're trying to have to communicate to business owners and helps you do that in a very easy to understand narrative report. Um, another way that this does um, that helps retain clients is it also helps train up the coming generation. Um, so it's going to help tighten those bonds between you, your firm and um, its clients. Um, ultimately, that can be done through a number of um, the solutions activities, um, which is helping to connect um, the firm to the customer um, by looking at their specific industry data, by understanding who they are, um, what things they need um, to look into, such as cash flow or turnover, and helping them do that in a way that they'll be able to understand um, and ultimately come back to you for more advisory engagements. Um, a couple of those things um, that are included in the narrative report is it helps um, basically convert numbers into plain language, into text that they can read, um, and also into graphical charts like you see on um, the screen up there. It helps break down their um, liquidity, profitability, and other um, interesting metrics that are going to be helpful to them. Um, it also helps them scorecard um, and highlight six key areas of strengths and weaknesses. Um, and it helps also helps them to compare themselves between um, their uh, competitors. Um, so it's a very useful for benchmarking, and it's something that you can implement. Um, and it's fully editable with Word, PDF, and uh, PowerPoint. Um, it helps you customize reports specifically for um, your customers. And so if you want to know a little bit more about the industry data as well, um, so it covers over 1,400 industries. Um, and they are all including industry-specific KPIs, such as turnover for restaurants. Um, and they help you to analyze operational efficiency. Um, the benefits of this is it helps you identify macro-level industry trends, and it helps you, you to develop your clients into specialized um, and diversified um, services. Um, another thing that the ProfitSense solution comes with um, is a projection tool that gives you the ability to run 
um, what if scenario analysis for consulting engagements to see how um, their your clients' financial decisions will end up um, in a couple of years to come, and other things in the market that they can consider. It also comes with a quick uh, calculated thumbnail, um, discounted cash flows valuation tool, and it produces a projected narrative analysis to help them understand um, what they're seeing. Um, additionally, another tool that comes with profit sense is our analytical procedures, um, which is what goes along in the beginning stages of your audit work. Um, it helps streamline audits by automatically generating expected values, threshold analysis, and industry comparisons, and includes a narrative report. Um, now, I also have structured pre-audit planning using customizable threshold values to identify areas um, of focus for your audit. Um, and you can clearly communicate all this through a globally accessible standardized documentation um, that is done within ProfitSense, um, which is shareable within um, your organization and also shareable with um, your clients. Um, and all these things ultimately help you quickly comply with audit and review guidelines um, and to help you get the audit in um, the most risk-free way. Um, so that is um, ProfitSense in a nutshell. Um, so I had a quick poll for you guys if you wanted to find out more about um, ProfitSense. I'm going to go ahead and launch that. Right, we're about at 50%, so I'm going to still wait a little bit more. I'm getting on up to 70. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close down the poll. All right, thank you. And so uh, at the end of the day, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, I'd also like to thank Renee and Brianna for presenting that wonderful information um, and insightfully how to effectively uh, transition clients. Um, if you have any questions for them, their contact information is on this page. Um, and also we'd want to encourage you to connect up with them on LinkedIn. And also if you have any questions about um, SageWorks or ProfitSense, um, feel free to email me um, or connect up with me on LinkedIn. Um, but thank you for joining us today, and we hope that you